In today's video, we will learn how to research vulnerabilities in CPUs, specifically side channel vulnerabilities. You might have read about them in the news as they keep popping up in any and all CPUs, but I haven't really looked at the technical details of these issues before because they always seemed so complex. But then Intel contacted me and asked me if I could showcase some Intel CPU hacks. So, Hats off to Intel and their project Circuit Breaker for sponsoring this video. They belong now to one of the very few companies who sponsor a video talking about vulnerabilities in their own products. That's still crazy to me. Times really are changing. So props to them. Anyway, let me share with you how you could find vulnerabilities in CPUs yourself. Sorry, before we can get to the hacking part, we have to understand two concepts first, caching and speculative execution. So let's start with caching. You probably know that inside of the CPU, we have caches. They are used to cache memory access to make reads and writes super fast. But I've never really played around with caches, so I wrote this code. This program is written in C and it measures memory access time in CPU cycles. So here you can see a list of memory accesses, but this particular access was super fast. Every memory access took hundreds of cycles, but this one took less than 100. The reason for that is because this particular memory was already in the cache, while the other data was not. You can see here why it can be important to optimize your code around cache access, because if you don't, your code could be like here, three to four times slower. Anyway, let's have a bit closer look into the code of my test program. First of all, this function here, RDT SCP. As you can see, there's actually some inline assembly. But it's short, it executes the instruction RDT SCP. So what does that do? Here is the Intel technical paper called How to Benchmark Code Execution Times on Intel Instruction Set Architectures. And in there, Intel explains how you can use the RDT SCP instruction to benchmark your code. So to measure how fast or slow your code is. And so the CPU is actually counting up a timer each cycle. And this instruction simply gets the current amount of CPU cycles into the EAX and EDX registers. So this function simply returns the current value, basically a timer. But now the main code. First, we allocate a big chunk of memory, 256 times 4096 bytes, and overwrite everything with null. In case you wonder, no, these values are not random. They have a reason. 4096 bytes is actually the page size for the Intel CPUs. A uh, page is like the smallest amount of memory you can deal with. If you want to read just four bytes from some address, the CPU will actually load the complete 4096 bytes page where this address belongs to. So we basically have a big memory array with 256 pages. Okay, after that, we have a bit of more magic code. These are Intel specific C functions, but they are basically also just wrappers around specific Intel assembly instructions. Here on the side, you can also look at the documentation and description of this function in more detail if you want. But basically, they just help us to make sure that we flush all loaded memory out of the cache. So after this loop, the memory we allocated only exists in RAM. It's not inside of any internal CPU cache anymore. But now look at what we do afterwards. Here we write hex ff into some memory. Now you know 4096 is the page size, so essentially we write hex 44 into the 42th page. And now comes our access measurement code. We loop over all 256 pages and for each page we take the current time. Then we access the memory and right afterwards we take another time measurement. The difference, so how long, how many cycles it took to access this memory page is now compared to a previous value. If access was faster than the previous, we remember the newest lowest time and the current page number. In the end, we want to find the page with the shortest access time. And then at the end of this loop, we simply print the page that was accessed the fastest. And there is no surprise, the 42th page access was super fast because before we took the measurement, we loaded this page into the CPU cache by writing to it. 
Awesome. We just saw the impact CPU caches can have and how we can measure it. And that will become super important soon. But let's quickly go back to the how to benchmark execution times paper from Intel because I just noticed something interesting in there. They quote here a sentence from the big Intel instruction manual which is a perfect segue into the second topic. The RDT SCP instruction waits until all previous instructions have been executed before reading the counter. However, subsequent instructions may begin execution before the read operation is performed. Huh? Instructions coming after the RDT SCP instruction might be actually be executed by the CPU before the RDT SCP instruction is finished? This could mess with the accurate time measurement and that's why Intel mentions it here. The instruction waits until previous instructions have been executed so they recommend to basically call it twice. This implements a barrier to avoid out of order execution of the instruction. Out of order execution. This is where the CPUs do some really crazy stuff to run faster and faster. Maybe you have heard of CPU pipelining before. Basically every instruction requires multiple CPU cycles to execute. I found this a bit older graphics from 2008 about the Intel processor pipeline. So first an instruction is fetched or loaded from memory, then the instruction is decoded in silicon and then there is more. It also depends on what the instruction does. But the point is, instead of doing these steps for each instruction after another, you can pipeline them. Meaning the part of the CPU that is responsible for fetching the instruction can already work on the next one even though the previous instruction isn't fully completed yet. Sounds like a simple optimization but actually there are lots of challenges. For example when you have a conditional jump, an if case, do you execute these or these instructions in the pipeline? So the CPU might mispredict what to pipeline and it has to throw away the instruction when it realizes it. And here's where it gets more complicated. The Intel graphic I showed you is so old because this basic pipelining concept is kinda outdated. Today's state of the art CPU optimizations go a huge step forward and it's called out of order execution. The basic idea is not every instruction depends on the previous one. For example this loop, we have a for loop incrementing i and it also increments the global variable a. In the assembly code you can see it loads a into eax, adds one and writes it back and for the i loop variable it just executes memory add directly on the address. As you can see the assembly code is sequential. First it increments a and then it increments i. But they are independent, the order doesn't matter. Incrementing i first and then a would have exactly the same result. And now think, what if the i variable was already in the cache but the global variable a was not? Now we would have to wait ages here until this code loaded the memory from RAM even though the following code doesn't really depend on it. So why not execute the increment of i as well as the compare and the conditional jump while we wait for the memory load from RAM? Stuff could go wrong when we do that. Maybe the code has a bug or tries to access something that it cannot access. Or in this case we have a conditional jump. The CPU might guess if it continues execution here or here and that's why it's called speculative execution. The CPU just speculates a bit of the code that might run next and start executing it in parallel. And if that code had a bug and caused an error or it predicted the jump wrong it would throw away anything speculatively executed and the program would run normal slow. But in our example everything was fine with that code and so when that first instruction is finally done loading the memory we can bring the speculative result from the shadow world over into the real world and overall the code completed very fast. So by executing instructions out of order we could get a really really fast CPU. And this is exactly what modern Intel CPUs do to achieve the speeds we want. So to summarize, we just learned about two concepts. The first one was caching. So memory pages are loaded from RAM into CPU caches when we access them in our code. And we can measure that. We can measure if a page was loaded into the cache or not by looking at how much time it takes to access these pages. And the second puzzle piece we need is the idea of speculative execution. The fact that the CPU might execute instructions in a different order. Hmm. We can measure if a page is loaded into a cache and the CPU might execute instructions out of order. 
we can check if a page is loaded in the cache and the CPU might speculate on some instructions. We can check if a page is present in the cache and the CPU might have speculatively executed some bad code. Huh. What if we get the CPU to speculatively access some data it shouldn't be allowed to access? Of course it will throw away any execution result because you cannot access it. But by that time it might have loaded something into the cache already and we could measure it. Is this a side effect, a side channel we could measure and exploit? Of course I'm not the first one with this idea. Check this out. Anders Fogg wrote this blog post in July 2017 negative result reading kernel memory from user mode. You are probably aware of the various CPU issues. There were tons of news about them. But keep in mind, this is a blog post from before the world learned about this new class of CPU vulnerabilities. It's incredibly fascinating to look back at this now. In this article, Anders first introduces the different layers of CPU caches down to the RAM and explains that the latency of data loaded into the L1 cache is around 5 clock cycles, whereas a load from main memory is typically around 200 clock cycles. After that, he introduces speculative execution and even references a talk he gave at Ruhr Universität in Bochum in 2017 explaining a lot of details about Intel CPU. The people sitting here probably didn't realize that this is cutting edge research that is about to explode roughly a year later. But now we come to Anders attack idea, abusing speculative execution. Let's say we have two moves. One tries to move a kernel address and the other move tries to move a normal address. This one doesn't work, you cannot access kernel memory and this would throw an exception. But here is how Anders thinks about it in terms of the out of order execution. If there are no dependencies, both will execute simultaneously. And while the second will never get its result committed to the registers because it will be discarded when the first move instruction causes an interrupt to be thrown, however, the second instruction will still execute speculatively and it may change the internal state of the CPU in a way that we can detect it. So he constructs this example here. Three lines of assembly, you move or load a value from a kernel address, mask it to only get one bit and then access a memory page. To understand what is special about this example, you have to imagine the two worlds. The real world and the shadow world or speculative world. In the real world, you cannot access kernel address. This code will segfault. But before we know the segfaults, the CPU might execute that code in the parallel, in the shadow world. It might load that kernel value and use that value to access some memory. And this could maybe affect the cache? If the last two instructions are executed speculatively, the address loaded differs depending on the value loaded from the kernel address. And thus the address loaded into the cache may cause different cache lines to be loaded. So even if this code sec falls in the real world, it might already be too late. And in the speculative world, this code was executed, loaded a value in the cache and we can measure it. And that was a really crazy idea Anders had. So he started experimenting with that idea, but ultimately it failed. It seems like the illegal reading of the kernel mode memory, but do not copy the result into the reorder buffer. So at this point, my experiment is failed and thus the negative result. While I did set out to read kernel mode without privileges and that produces a negative result, I do feel like I opened a Pandora's box. And oh yes, he did. He was so close. But since then, a lot has happened. Today we know about this new class of CPU vulnerabilities and in this video I want to highlight one particular research in more detail and that is Riddle, Rogue In-Flight Data Load. So let me introduce you to Sebastian Oesterlund, co-author of the Riddle paper who will tell us the story of how Riddle was discovered. So I'm Sebastian Oesterlund, a PhD student at FUSEC Amsterdam and uh... One of the co-authors of the Riddle paper My background is operating system security, side channels, fuzzing, whatever, like system security in essence. 
most of the time when people explain vulnerabilities, and that is often the case with the research papers, it only covers and explains that particular vulnerability. And those are complex topics. So for an outsider like me, it is really helpful to understand what was the path that led to the discovery like this. What were the building blocks to build this? And so I wanted to go back to the beginning. How did all of this happen? So I think this blog post by Anders Fogg was one of the starting points really there where, where it was like it had like a negative results uh, blog post about uh, speculative execution thing and then other people started looking into it and then, then there was uh, another paper by george is one of the co-authors from uh, on riddle so he, he had like this also a negative results paper called speculos so he, i think he had like a small like missing one small step why it wasn't working basically so as you can see, the world was about to discover this new class of issues thanks to people like Anders and Georgi who shared their research ideas and results even though they failed. They had a feeling there must be more and so sharing the negative results, the failed attempts allowed other researchers to build on top of that and ultimately discover MDS. This is textbook science. Collaboratively, the world started to figure this out. In the moment, not so amazing for Intel though, oops. But it's tough. How could hardware engineers predict something like this years ago when they designed these CPUs? When it took this much scientific collaborations of security researchers to figure this out? Anyway, lots of challenges and new developments ahead for Intel now. But Riddle was not the first issue that was published. If we look at the timeline, then at the point of the Riddle discovery, there were already other known MDS issues. So researchers like Sebastian had already a much better understanding of this Intel CPU microarchitecture and were able to dig deeper. For example, one of the known weaknesses at the time was foreshadow and foreshadow NG and a colleague of Sebastian played around with that. One of my colleagues, Stefan, was work, actually working on something. He was looking at like the foreshadow NG stuff and then see how it interacts with like these tagged TLB entries that are tagged by process identifier and see if you can somehow circumvent that and like uh, leak stuff across processes or something like that. Because you have these checks that go on in parallel while it's resolving like virtual address and there's a, a, like a race condition. No worries, I didn't understand a word either. But it doesn't matter, because the only thing you should take away from this is that clearly Sebastian and his colleagues knew a lot more about CPUs now. And they had many new ideas to mess around with. Ideas for attacks they wanted to try out. And Stefan wrote a test program. It's one out of many they have written. You have to imagine, they always come up with weird ideas to test. And this is the story of one of those weird ideas. He had, like, he had this program written to, to do it. And in the end, like, it had a bug in it. So it was creating two threads. And they were going to have like a shared page that, so that they have the same virtual and physical addresses when they access something. But he mapped in the page after like creating the threads. So one process was basically a null pointer and the other one, it was valid memory. And then at some point, like, so we're leaking like this, this secret value that was only in one thread and not in the other. And later you start looking into that. Okay, wait, this is, wait, it's not even using a valid, like virtual address. It's just dereferencing a null pointer inside this TSX stuff. How does, the, how, how can this happen? Like it's, it's insane. Sebastian is saying threads here, but I think he speaks Intel language. He means processes. And you see that when you have a look at this code, in the main function it calls fork, so it creates a child process and a parent process. So let's see what the two processes do. The child or victim process is very simple. It simply has a while loop that writes a secret value hex42 into this secret memory. And now look at the parent. I hope this code looks familiar. Compare this to the cache testing code from the start of the video. First, we create a big buffer with 256 pages. We clear the buffer and then we flush the pages out of the cache. And then we see a loop going over the 256 pages measuring the access time, like in our cache test. The only difference is the magical part in between. This is the riddle attack but they didn't know it yet. They tried to test something else, but had a bug here. So the code here is loading a byte from the secret variable and uses the byte as an offset into the big buffer. So this might load one of the 256 pages. So to figure out what the byte was we loaded, we can measure the access time. The page with the shortest access time tells us what byte was loaded here. 
And here's the bug. Sebastian said they wanted to map the same memory in the child and the parent process. That's why both processes access the secret. The child writes to the secret and the parent reads a byte from the secret. But the memory is only allocated in the child, in the parent, secret is still a null pointer. If we run this program in a debugger like GDB, we will get a sec fault. We can see the register is zero, so it tried to load a value from a null pointer. But Stefan didn't notice that because of this code at the start of the parent process. Here they set up a sec fault handler. So when the process receives a sec fault, this handler code is executed. And this simply updates the RIP, the instruction pointer. Basically this is skipping the exception like oops, but continues the program. That's why when you really run this program, the parent process doesn't crash. There are constantly sec faults happening here, but the handler ignores them, so they didn't notice their bug. So what is happening now? This code executes 100,000 loops. In each loop, it flushes the buffer, then tries to read a byte from a null pointer. This of course causes a sec fault in the real world, but remember the shadow world, the speculative execution world. The idea is that here the CPU executed this code speculatively and used some byte loading some page into the cache. Of course, eventually the CPU realizes it cannot access the null pointer. It will sec fault. The secfall handler ignores the error and recovers execution, but then we come here. We measure the cache access time of the pages. And if access to a page took less than 80 cycles, it must have been in the cache. So we increment a counter for that page and remember that. If we let it run for a while, and keep in mind, in parallel, the child process always keeps writing hex 42. This is the result. Here we are printing how often certain pages appear to be in the cache. Why the F was 42 loaded in the cache? They just discovered an unexpected behavior, what they would soon call riddle. So because of a coding bug, doing something weird that shouldn't be possible, reading a byte from a null pointer, they leaked a value from another process. They didn't know why. So it's kind of a weird like process with these things. Like you start with something that works and then try to work back. Okay, how does it actually work? Which I, I guess is like, it's very like, I don't know, experimental science, I guess. I love it. It's almost like physics in the 1700s where you make some weird observation and experiments at home and work your way backwards to figure out the science. And then, okay, you can start reading these CPU like architecture manuals. And all of a sudden, like we saw like, the Intel manual mentioning line fill buffer and then dropping the term altogether. So it was just mentioned one off somewhere. And then you had to go start looking into patents to basically like reverse engineer because this is not stuff that's public information, right? So Stefan, uh, like a colleague of mine, spent an uh, insane amount of time going through all these patents to basically create this whole uh, diagram for uh, the Skylake uh, microarchitecture. So yeah, this graphics here, which looks so official, is something they reverse engineered. They learned about line fill buffers from the Intel manual, but how this all works, they had to piece together the puzzle from reading Intel patents. So these line buffers are internal CPU buffers. Like caches, they temporarily hold some data and it's used to improve memory performance. And they realized that accessing a non-existing address caused a value from the line buffer to be used during speculative execution. While code was executed out of order, it used this value from the buffer to load a page into the memory cache. And this is a side effect that can be measured to figure out what the byte was. This is the story of Riddle. Of course, this is complex stuff and there are a lot of details I brushed over, but I feel like I finally cracked the secret of finding these CPU vulnerabilities. If you look at all of them, they all kind of follow the same pattern. For example, let's compare Riddle and Foreshadow. First, prepare a buffer with some pages and flush them out of the cache. Two, do something weird that is executed in the shadow world, the speculative execution world that might have a side effect of loading a specific page into the cache. And then three, measure the cache access times to figure out what value you leaked. Absolutely fascinating. You can really see how this initial idea from the failed research blog post and paper grew into really clever techniques. And of course, this goes beyond Intel CPUs. The technical details might be different, but the same underlying ideas and techniques can be adapted to other CPUs and even entirely different architectures. 
thanks so much Sebastian and your colleagues for sharing this story. I hope I was able to do it justice and thanks again for Intel for being brave and sponsoring a video like this. It still blows my mind Intel wants more people to learn about vulnerabilities they had in their products. That is truly forward thinking security strategy and shows confidence. So check out Intel's Project Circuit Breaker over at projectcircuitbreaker.com. This is an effort by Intel to foster a community of hackers and researchers around security research on Intel products and this video is part of it. So go check out their site and keep an eye out for any of their upcoming events, content and maybe capture the flag competitions.